1. When I was about seven years old, my father bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi, about 1.5 hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about five miles from a paved road. To get to our land, it took nearly ten minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house, he built a small lake, more like a pond. It was about the length of a football field, but wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take Route A, which was a hard, packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was beautiful in the spring. Route B was about a hundred yards east of Dogwood Lane, and we named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days, and it had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was not for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and my little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour or two. I was ten years old, so I decided to go fishing while listening to Bama play Ole Miss. The game was the usual Bama win, so I thought I could ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake. So I carried my pole, small radio, and my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bully that never left my side, and it was on this day that I realized how awesome he really was. Onto the lake we went. Picture a large oval roughly the size of a football field, but larger with an L-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up to a more severe decline to the shore, and then the small pier. Across the lake on the west side, there was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam, and the south ended up in thick, swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized later. About five minutes after I threw out my line, and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I have come to recognize well and it may have saved my life that day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bully must have felt it too, because a few seconds later, I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west, to the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from the lake. I turned my head in that direction, and almost immediately my eyes lit on what I thought to be a half silhouette of a large man behind a tree. It was too far to make out details, but close enough to be sure of what I was seeing. Almost five minutes went by, and right before I scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half-silhouette moved behind the tree slowly. Billy stood and growled louder, and I told him quietly to stop, and I turned my head north towards the dam, while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next ten minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure moved slowly from tree to tree, always north and always facing me. The saying scared stiff was something I found to be true. For some reason I thought it important that whoever or whatever it was did not know I was aware. I finally realized that the figure's path was bringing it closer to the dam which would make its path to me shorter and easier. My paralysis broke, and I casually put down the fishing pole and started walking towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that walk was the hardest thing I have ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was, was screaming across the dam towards me, when I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bully dashed ahead of me, and my anger turned into admiration as he stopped some twenty yards ahead and faced north until I passed him. 
He continued this action the entire run home. My dog was watching my back. Just epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep up on a ten-year-old boy was up to no good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns as well as his thirty-eight revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings and the woods behind them. My family returned shortly after, and for some reason I did not mention what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends or my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were with us. What scares me the most, though, is the fact that our closest neighbors were about two miles northwest of us, with thick woods in between as the crow flies. Who or what the hell was watching me from the woods that day? Guess I may never know. I sometimes wish I could go back there again, as a grown man with military training as I am now. Billy lived a full life, and was put to sleep peacefully, as a very old but great dog. The best dog I have ever known. Edit. My dad sold the land a few years after this incident, and bought a beach house on the beautiful Gulf Coast. I didn't mind. 2. During my freshman year of high school, I acquired a creeper named Terence. His obsession with me stemmed from a hard life at home, and from what he told me, I was the only one who ever listened to a thing he had to say. He followed me around school, asking me out on a weekly basis, bringing me gifts that I just couldn't allow myself to accept. He was a nice guy, I won't lie. He was just a tad possessive. The only time he caused me physical harm of any sort was when I refused to have a staring contest with him and he squeezed my arm so hard it bruised. But like I said, he was a nice guy and I knew he meant nothing bad. Whenever he had the smallest idea that I was mad at him, he flew into a bout of depression and shut himself away from everyone until I assured him everything was fine. I always figured Terence would eventually get over me. I was new to the school, and thought that my face would eventually blend in like everyone else's, and my voice would just fade into the distant background. One day, Terence took his creepy demeanor a little too far beyond my comfort zone. My dad called me after practice to let me know that he couldn't give me a ride home. I tried to bum a ride from a friend, but at the time, everyone else relied on their parents and I didn't know them well enough to feel comfortable asking. My house wasn't too far away, but I was a slow walker and knew that it would take me 45 minutes to an hour. Despite my achy legs, I sucked it up, strapped my bag on and hit the road. Just as I reached the hill behind my school, I turned to find Terence puffing along up the pavement. Why haven't you gone home? It's 4.30. I asked, already feeling uncomfortable in his presence. We had never been alone together anywhere but the parking lot. I heard you were walking home today, he smiled, attempting to grab the track bag from my shoulders. I pulled it away from him and continued. It's kind of far, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. Ah, my mom's not coming until five anyway, let me walk you home. Go back to school, Terence. Regardless of how much I pleaded with him, he trotted alongside me and wouldn't take no for an answer. As we passed the golf course along a very busy stretch of road, the sidewalk got thinner and we were smushed together side by side. By now I was more than halfway home and had grown increasingly agitated by Terence's persistence. The kid was just blabbering away, talking all kinds of nonsense about how many kids he wants to have how perfect I was for him, and no matter how many times I swatted his hands away, he kept trying to hold mine. Please don't touch me, Terence, I snapped. He was oblivious to my irritation. Just one hug? And without my permission, he drew even closer than he already was, 
causing me to back off the curb and into the bike lane of the street. Infuriated, I picked myself up as a green Toyota pickup truck swerved into another lane. The driver wasn't angry, he just looked back to make sure I got up, and then continued down until the road diverged from the side of the golf course. Terence, you aren't walking me home. Call your mom and tell her to pick you up here. I almost felt bad as he spewed apologies, but I simply grumbled and continued down the sidewalk. Just as I was about to turn up my street, I heard a car pulling up beside me. I turned my head to face the approaching vehicle and to my surprise, it was the same green Toyota truck that almost ran me over. I gasped before the driver turned his head, he wasn't too old, probably in his thirties and he smiled at me, a very nervous smile. Excuse me, do you know where the golf course is? I recognized his face, and there was no doubt that I saw this man drive past me, right next to the golf course. I stood with my mouth open before finally telling him the intersecting roads that the entrance lied on. He pulled his truck closer and asked me to repeat the directions. The more I talked to him, the more nervous he looked before he finally asked, Do you need a ride home? All the elementary school videos and Girl Scout lectures were flashing through my head. I smiled at him. No, I'm close. He drove even closer, pulling his car around until the passenger door was only a few feet away. I could see he was actually shaking. And just before he opened his mouth once more, a car horn honked, causing both of us to jump. Terence and his mom quickly drove past us, with hands flapping out the open windows and a long, sorry, trailing in the wind. The man looked at me once more and wiped his forehead. He asked me my name, I told him a fake one, and he repeated it several times, each more soft and quiet. He asked me my ethnicity, and I told him to guess. Finally, he drove off, and I circled another block, before finally running home. At the time, I didn't quite realize the severity of the situation. I knew that this was not something that anybody was supposed to ask a girl who was walking home alone. But the more I thought, the more I realized that this guy probably had something else on his mind. I didn't even see golf clubs in his car. My house was quite the detour from the road he had been driving on. There was no way he would have took so many extra turns unless he was following me. I like to think that it was because of Terence's persistence. Nothing beyond a rather creepy encounter happened that day. Sometimes not all creepers have bad intentions. 3. I'm 22. I live alone in a one-bedroom apartment, which actually looks more like a motel room with a tiny kitchen in it. Despite its small size, I have managed to distribute all my furniture and appliances to give it a very comfy feeling to it. Next to the entrance door, there is the TV space with a two-person sofa, a red armchair and a wooden coffee table. Next to this, there's the dining space and kitchen with a table, the stove, a sink and the fridge. My bed is located by the wall opposite to the entrance door so I can watch TV while laying down, which is great. Behind the TV, there's quite a large jealousy window, the ones with several parallel glass panels that are tilted open. With white curtains covering it, my room is second in a row of four rooms in total that connects with another row of four rooms, forming an L-shape. In the middle of this expensive compound of rooms, there is a space with some trees where some of the neighbors keep their cars and bikes. And everything is enclosed by high walls and a remote operated electric gate. The rooms are connected by a long porch lit up at night with fluorescent lights. There is one light in front of every apartment. The light allows me to see through the curtains, like the shape of the tree closest to my room. This made me feel uneasy the first couple of months after living there. I was sure one night I'd see something scary through the curtains, 
like Norman Bates's shape behind the shower curtains in Psycho. But all I ever got to see was my neighbor's silhouettes moving around, chasing cats away or just out for a smoke. The gate and walls made me feel safer, and I got used to it. I've been living there for two years now. One night, three months ago, I was lying on my bed reading an e-book on my laptop when I heard a whistled tune outside. It was a creepily happy melody, like carousel music, or at least that's what it made me think of. My first thought was that it was my neighbor who smokes a lot, and that he was out having a cigarette. But then that meant he wasn't really smoking, because the whistling was continuous, unpaused. I'm not the most courageous guy around, so getting up to look outside the window was never an option for me. When something scared me, I always decided to lie down facing the wall and try to fall asleep, which is exactly what I did this time. But the whistling got louder in seconds. I could hear it was getting closer to my window. I got shivers running down my spine, and I closed my eyes tightly, hoping it was the lady next door drunk again and trying to find her way into her room. The whistling got even louder now. It was right in front of my room. I turned around slowly away from the wall to face my apartment, and then I saw it. Through the white curtains I could see the distinctive shape of a man with long hair, and he was facing directly towards my room. He didn't move. He was just standing there, whistling this horrible tune that made me feel inside a horror movie and start sweating. Was this some kind of pervert trying to watch me sleeping or something? But he didn't move. He stood there for what felt like hours not moving a single muscle. I'm not sure why, but now it was clear to me that he wasn't one of the neighbors. I wondered if anybody else in the place had hurt him. I couldn't turn my eyes away from him. I thought about all the psychos from scary stories, and that if I pulled the curtains aside, I would see the most twisted face staring at me. I armed myself with courage to mutter the words, Who's there? Which barely came out of my mouth. No answer. The silhouette just stood there, still whistling. Who's there? I asked now in a more aggressive tone. This is when the shape turned around and started walking slowly towards my front door. Hopefully it was ultimately one of my neighbors or maybe a creepy guest and was now heading inside their room. Then my door handle moved. He was trying to get in. This is when I completely lost it. I grabbed my cell phone and went into the bathroom and locked myself in. I called the police first, and then the landlord who lived next door in a house. I explained that there was someone trying to break into my apartment. I was sure I'd be dead by the time they came, but it turned out the whistler had given up. The police would get him now, but they couldn't find anybody. When the police arrived, I told them what had happened, and they searched the entire neighborhood. One of the neighbors said she had seen everything from her room, but did not have a cell phone to call anyone. She said that after trying to get in, the guy, who was wearing saggy clothes and looked like a homeless, walked nonchalantly towards the perimeter wall and climbed up, jumping over it. And he never stopped whistling. The landlord got electric barbed wire on top of the walls after this. This is pretty common in my country, actually since it's pretty dangerous everywhere, and I haven't seen anything but that tree through the curtains since then. I still sleep with my face turned to the wall, but I always think I'll hear that whistling again. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 211. Thanks very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Uh, you know, I was thinking about story number two, and I think, really, although the guy in the Toyota certainly did not have good intentions, I don't think there's any doubt about that, uh, that poor young lady wouldn't even have been in that situation were it not for the creepy little friend she had. 
That boy might have just been awkward, but uh, there comes a point when a guy's got to realise he's acting creepy. Hell, we can all be creeps without meaning to. I've done it myself. You know, you you like somebody, you find yourself looking over at them a bit too often, but you realise you're doing it, get over it and move on with your life. Terence, I think that was his name, he seemed oblivious, but this was a few years ago, so hopefully he grew out of it. Okay, and with that I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.